Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and you're definitely in for a treat, because I'm going to be reviewing an animated fairy tale classic that came out on November 17, 1989, now celebrating its 30th anniversary. It's called The Little Mermaid. Yes, a story about a young mermaid named Ariel, right here on these two covers, who wants to become human. So that way, she'll be able to discover above the surface while she's living under the sea. Yep, this is the Diamond Edition DVD and Blu-ray release. So yeah, this is the Diamond Edition Blu-ray and DVD release that I picked up at Walmart um, during Black Friday. And this is the Platinum Edition to this. A DVD special edition that I picked up at Best Buy back in 2006. So yes, I have both copies. Um, both of them with nice uh, cover arts they chose. Yes, um, now both the now the Diamond Edition did ported most of the features from the Platinum Edition that we have, and I'm definitely going to show you. Uh, I'm going to start with the Diamond Edition. Which, um, yep, same as usual. It comes with a, a music video by Carly Rae Jepsen. He has the same artist who sang the song Call Me Maybe. Uh, but she sang her version of Part of Your World. And, of course, they had a new state of the art digital restoration, which apparently, um, was a trouble one because there were a few scenes that were sort of um, had some errors in it but they did fix it later on unfortunately I, I have the one with the errors so what can we do but don't worry because I, I have the DVD release that has the correct ones but hey, and they have the crappy Oki sing along, which actually has um, all the songs from the movie. You know, Part of Your World, Under the Sea, Kiss the Girl, Poor Fortunate Souls. Yeah. Even has the uh, never before seen deleted character, Harold the Merman. Even shows the part of her world, which is the voyage to the new fantasy land, that Jody Benson, yeah, the voice actress who did the voice of Ariel you know, experience it at the Disney parks. And of course they go behind the scenes with today's top Disney animators you know, at, at the Walt Disney Animation Studios and which is dedicated to Roy Disney in Burbank, California. You know, which I often see that place uh, when we go to the freeway. <laughs> yeah. So, a whole lot more though. I know there's a new uh, 4K um, Ultra HD release. Yeah, same goes with um, the Wizard of Oz that I previously reviewed. Yeah, so I forgot to mention that. Yeah, going off topic here, but hey. But this is a nice release anyway. I mean, I'm glad to have this when I bought it. And, yeah, it's a two disc set, of course. So you can see right here. It has 71. Okay. So now I'm going to get to um, this one. Yep, same as usual. Has all the features, um, as I mentioned, all which are on the, the Blu ray. And I'm going to see if we can open it. Okay. Yeah, just a. Uh, yeah, just a flyer for all the sweepstakes, you know, winning for Disney Cruise Line. And there's, um, okay, I know it's hard. Yeah, this is a DVD guide, which includes the movie rewards. Um, it's already been used, so, but anyway. Just tells you all the features that's included. Um, yep. 
and it takes you directly to where you are. Yeah, they used to have these uh, at the time, but they did it for Blu-rays too, but not anymore. And I know they had to flip everything here. <laughs> okay. So yes, this is your guide. Um. Okay. Um. There's a DVD. Has the artwork with Ariel. And then there's Sebastian with Flounder. Yeah. So it's a very nice set. Glad to own. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I just want to show you some more here. There's a cruise line and... Yeah, just uh, a birthday party to come with it. I know. And all these uh, all these accessories, yeah, yeah, toys, yeah, action figures from the movie that you can get or dowels, everything, yeah. Okay, I know it's so just putting this back the way it was. So, yep, that's the Little Mermaid. <laughs> anyway, the, the first time I went to see the Little Mermaid, um, I was four years old. Actually, the first time I went to see it, though, was at AMC in Burbank, California. Yeah, it was known as AMC 10 Theaters, which will soon become the 14. And now it's been demolished and they, because they had to build the new AMC across the street, which is called AMC 16 Theaters. They now added an IMAX. Adobe Cinema and all this other stuff included to make this theater even better than ever. <laughs> okay, so still there. It's been built um, since uh, 2002, opened in 2003, and so on. Okay, now, um, and then I later saw. As a double feature, as I mentioned in my previously reviewed um, The Wizard of Oz, that I actually saw that as a double feature. It was nice to see both films uh, together, a classic film and and this animated feature. It's like it's like a, some, a miracle that's ready to happen. <laughs> so I have fun. And then later I saw the 1997 re-release um, when I was 12 years old. This time I saw it with my father. And my brother, and even my sister Eileen. So this will be the first time she even got to see it on the big screen, and it was amazing. Looks as as spectacular as I remembered it. Okay. Anyway, let, let's um, get to um, the information here before we can get to the review. It's the 28th Disney animated feature film, which would soon become a franchise for the series. Because we had two direct-to-video sequels, yeah, which is Return to Sea and Ariel's Beginning, which to me is the best one after the first movie. Yeah, because I, I like having to see what the prequel was like, in my opinion. So you get to see her under the sea, you know, getting curious and everything before all, all this had happened. And, um, of course, it's loosely based on the Hans Christian Andersen book which had a very sad story as we speak, um, especially from the, the ending. But it did turn out to be a feel-good movie, so they had to do some changes. Uh, joining in with director Ron Clemmings and John Musker, who just previously worked on The Great Mouse Detective, uh, along with the other directors. So this was going to be their new um, Disney Renaissance era, which is going to start um, from scratch, you know, continuing to release all these fairy tale adaptations just like they did uh, in the past with films like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Pinocchio, as well as Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, I mean, those films. So they wanted to continue with that, that legacy. 
and they join in with Howard Ashman and John Mus. They join in with um, Howard Ashman and Alan Minkin to to create the score, but also team up together to write all the lyrics uh, for these songs. So it plays like a musical romantic fantasy, and it did. Now I know um, they were thinking that this was not going to be a sequel to Splash, which that was uh, Disney's uh, Touchstone Pictures' his first film. You know, the one with Tom Hanks, Daryl Hannah, John Candy, and and Eugene Levy. Yeah, that film that was directed by Ron Howard, which is a fun movie about uh, a mermaid who came from under the sea, suddenly uh, meets uh, a young man, soon they fall in love, and so of course she only had three days, she only had several days and stuff. So this one is, um, but this one's quite different too. And um, now this was of course the last film to actually use traditional hand-drawn uh, cell animation because later on they were creating a program called CAPS, which is going to, which is, um, which is stand for, um, I'm trying to find, which is stand for Computer Animation Production System that they were going to, that was created by Pixar, by the way, that they were going to use for their next uh, animated feature, uh, The Rescuers Down Under, which happens to be the sequel to The Rescuers. Of course, as we all know, uh, Howard Ashman and Alan Minkin had previously worked on Little Shop of Horrors, so I thought this was pretty interesting that this was going to be their next project uh, after a few years. Um, and I know Ashman passed away in 1991 you know, after he was working on Beating the Beast and Aladdin for the original songs. Anyway. So as for the animation, um, this was considered to be the last film to use traditional hand-drawn cell animation, which this was at the time they had to work at an animation facility in Glendale, California. Yes, because uh, back in 1985, you know, they had them. They were already planning on adding a new. Um, they're adding some new rooms for animation, and they were gonna, you know, take out all the other animate, all these other animation facilities uh, that they got, yeah, you know, the ones that they worked on in the past, and move it to another facility so that way they'll have more space, and that way they can move all this other um, random stuff and everything that they stored in to a, a different area. So yeah, it was difficult for everyone, for all the animation staff out there who worked so hard, but in the end, you know, things turned out for the better. So, yes, um, as a result of this, because they've been doing it for decades, uh, they did actually use live-action references um, to provide uh, the actors and actresses to perform all these body movements, you know, and everything that they move around, you know, for those key scenes so the animators can actually animate those scenes and match together so it would work and at that rate they cast uh, Sherry Stoner to provide it um, the model for Ariel uh, along with um, Josh Finkel who, to provide um, the model for Eric and um, they just did several of those scenes here and there that matches completely. So now we begin to see where they all came from. And of course, Sherry Stoner, as we all know, she became the writer of Tiny Toot Adventures, Animaniacs, even Pinky and the Brain. She was also the producer. She even wrote the live action CGI film uh, Casper from 1995. It's hard to believe she she was Ariel, <laughs> you know, where she practiced all the um, the movements and everything. But they did cast uh, Jodie Benson, 
to provide the voice for her. So, so they had to use it on playback to see how it matches. And so they were going to get Sherry to do this, uh, but no such luck. Uh, then they were going to get another voice actress. I couldn't believe I, I'm actually hearing this, but it turned out to be Marissa Fawn. Yes, long before she went on to do um, Digimon and Invader Zim. Yes, she did the voice of Wika or several of the other Digimon characters or and even <laughs> Gas for um, Invader Zim. So they also had um, also Caps did use um, some key scenes. Also uh, Caps did actually use um, the scenes for the um, of the ships, you know, which um, creates all these um, all these wrecks, and even has the final battle that they shot very well, and so they had to blend in together with the traditional animation and several of the other scenes here. So that was cool. And yeah, they were casting several voice actors besides Jody Benson, and she was beautiful. Definitely matched her very well. Pat Carroll. I know they were going to get other actresses like, like B. Arthur from The Golden Girls and Maud because uh, the character Ursula, the sea witch, was actually modeled after uh, Divine. And they were going to get her, but she turned it down. Then they were going to get other actresses like Nancy Wilson, Roseanne, Charlotte Ray yeah, from The Facts of Life. As well as uh, Elaine Strix and Nancy uh, Marchin. But eventually they cast um, Pat Carroll, and she was the right choice. Uh, then they were going to get other actors uh, to play the parts. I, I couldn't believe it, but they actually were going to get Jim Carrey to do the voice of Prince Eric. Anyway, it's the ship that they use. Um, almost looks like a pirate ship, but it's actually uh, a ship for. For the prince and crew and all that. And they also were going to get uh, Bill Maher and, and Michael Richards. Yes, Michael Richards uh, from Seinfeld. To do the voice of Scuttle. But they settled for legendary comedian uh, Buddy Hackett. But of course we got Christopher Daniel Barnes. Um, who was in the TV series um, called Starman. Based on the 1984 John Carpenter film, and he would later went on to do the voice of, you guessed it, Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man, in the 1994 series. And he also went on to play Great Brady in the live-action Brady Bunch movies. Yeah, that was him. So yeah, the rest was history. I mean, the main reason why they were hoping for their success was because they just did uh, The Great Mouse Detective and they also did Two Friend Roger Rabbits. So that was their biggest uh, challenge, hoping that this was going to be a bigger hit. Even with Oliver and Company that came out a year before. And what a surprise, because by the time it came out, it became a blockbuster. For its 40 million. For its 40 million budget, I mean, the first release, um, as it came out um, for its success, it, it made, um, it actually made um, 84.4 million dollars at the time. Yeah, it was big. But then when they re released it in 1997, November 14, which this was when uh, Anastasia was coming out. Another, another great film. It actually made uh, even more. So it suddenly brought in, so they drew 123 million dollars at the box office, but it only came out uh, for, only for one month only. But then they had to play it again. So for those who miss it on the big screen, I mean, I know people have the VHS tapes, but they want to be able to experience it the way. Other people had experienced it uh, back in 89, 1990. 
um, that um, soon it was going to be uh, a great challenge, that it was going to become even more of a future hit, enough to provide for franchise and all that. Oh, and, and to note that, yes, they even had um, an animated series that came out in 1992 that aired on CBS. Yeah. So that's how popular it was. And I forgot to note that. <laughs> okay. Now let's, um, and yes, I know there was controversy, uh, especially um, when it was released on home video. They had that cover art where they claimed that... Um, and I, I know I don't want to be able to mention this here, but I might as well. But they claim that the castle looked almost like uh, human penises. So they had to change that. And then um, there was another uh, controversy, which um, God, too many of them. was that um, there was a clergyman that, that was presented over the wedding between Eric and Ursula, disguised as Vanessa, to have an erection. And that's not something we want to see, but... But I know, I mean... I guess it's what we expected when we... when we saw and we didn't realize. But they, they, they had to deal with it. Well, anyway, um... Enough with the chatter, let's uh, get to the film. It stars Jody Benson, Christopher Daniel Barnes, uh, Pat Carroll, Samuel E. Wright, Jason Moran, Kenneth Mars, Buddy Hackett, Patty Edwards, Ben Wright, Edie McClure, Kimmy Robertson, Caroline Besek, Will Ryan, and Renee. Arbogonis, yes, from Benson, and later went on to do Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And it's written and directed by Ron Clemens and John Musker, which they both later went on to do Aladdin and Hercules. The movie begins when we meet a young 16-year-old mermaid princess named Ariel who lives in a fantasy kingdom in the Atlantic Ocean called Atlantica where she's fascinated by the human world above, that she just goes around uh, collecting gizmos and gadgets and all these other human artifacts um, under the sea, joined by her best friend, Flounder, who's a yellow fish, until they were being chased down by a ferocious shark, and they escape as soon as they can to the surface of the ocean to visit a seagull named Scuttle, which they often do, where... Scuttle just often finds very inaccurate knowledge of human culture. Um, during the exploring, uh, Ariel just found a pipe and a fork, and she actually collects all of these artifacts in her grotto. Unfortunately, she does ignore all the warnings of her father, who happens to be the ruler of Atlantica, King Triton, joins by a red crab, serves as an advisor and court composer, Sebastian. Um, she actually misses her um, orchestra performance that she was about to do in her debut, joined by her sisters, who are yeah, mermaids, and also joined in by her family relatives, who are all mer people, you know, mer boys, mer girls. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, um, the problem was though was that. Trident decided to warn the uh, Ariel that if you go all over the um, the surface of the ocean, danger will lie ahead to you, and humans are going to go around attacking you, just like what happened a long time ago when he was quite young and he soon realized that you know there was a war between humans and and mer people, so it's like they consider them as barbarians. So. And he, he doesn't want to have that danger happening to her daughter, no, to his daughter. But Ariel refuses to listen and soon realizes that he's not, that she's not a child anymore. She wants to move on to her life to become human. She wants to learn everything what humans do. And that's where she sings the song, Part of Your World. 
She wants to be part of it. Yeah. And yeah, I, and it was sung lovely by Jody Benson herself, who provided the voice of Ariel. Um, that's uh, written by Howard Ashman. It was just incredibly beautiful. The way she sings, the way she swims around, you know, discovering what it is. Oh, that was just amazing. Well, anyway, Sebastian just uh, had an advice uh, for trying to actually um, mention that, you know, if I was the father, I'd be able to discipline my kids, if that ever happens. So that's when Titan, so that's when Triton decided to uh, hire Sebastian to look after Ariel to see what she's up to, which that's the case. So one night, uh, Ariel, Flounder, and Sebastian had traveled to the ocean surface to watch a celebration for Prince Eric's birthday on a ship. It looks like a pirate ship, but it's basically a ship for for all prince out there and for kings and everyone else so they joined by their side by Grinsby happens to be Eric's ballet and Carlotta Eric's maid he also has a shaggy dog named Max <laughs> and they're actually presenting a, a birthday surprise gift that they worked on for for Eric so even Scardle uh, joins in the board too and Ariel had instantly falls in love with him because he was very handsome. But shortly afterwards, a violent storm hits um, and it crashes down the ship. It, it, it winds up in flames until it went straight into the gunpowder. Eric was trying to, to save Max and everyone else had escaped until it blasted and Eric had suddenly fell overboard until Ariel had rescued him and brings him to shore that's when she sings the second verse of part of your world which immediately leaves just as he regains consciousness to avoid being discovered and he suddenly became fascinated by the memory of her voice and the way she smiles and how beautiful she she looks underneath the sun I thought wow so Eric vows to find a girl who saved his life and sang to him so that way you know soon he'll be married but Ariel bows to find a way to join him in this world so that's when everyone had noticed the change in her behavior so Trident had questioned Sebastian about what's going on and why is she acting like this well he spilled the beans and said that I tried to warn her but she wouldn't listen. Apparently she went over there and she instantly fell in love with Eric. Yeah. Who's a handsome prince. Who's a handsome prince. So Triton had so at this rate, um, Sebastian was uh, trying to cheer uh, Ariel up and trying to tell her that everything is a lot better under the sea. Yeah, and that's where we hear the song, Under the Sea. But then Flounder had to uh, whisper uh, Ariel to to tell uh, her that he bought in a surprise for her, and that turned out to be the statue of Prince Eric that they all worked on, which actually fell all the way underneath the the ocean. That uh, they they carried uh, directly to her grotto, but suddenly Trident had appeared and confront uh, Ariel one more time. But she wouldn't listen. One more, t and so what is she? So what he has to do is destroy all the artifacts that she found, including the statue that she, and with his trident, and just destroyed it completely. And that's when trident leaves. Um, Ariel got very upset. She cried and tell the, both Sebastian and Flounder to go away. Suddenly two eels named Flosim and Jetsim had convinced Ariel to visit the sea witch, a very uh, devilish type named Ursula. So what does Ursula do? 
She makes a deal with Ariel to transform her into a human for three days to exchange her voice. Yes. So that means that she won't be able to speak at all. She had to put uh, her voice directly into a nausea shell to keep. So within these three days, Ariel must receive the kiss of true love. Yes, true love's kiss from Eric and hoping that by then she'll remain human permanently. So otherwise she'll transform back into a mermaid and it'll belong to uh, Ursula for the rest of her life. Yeah, this is going to be pretty tough because she just signed a contract with her, like she's making the deal with the devil. Biggest mistake she made in her life, yeah, which is poor fortunate souls that Ursula had saved. Yeah. Anyway, Ariel accepts and was then given human legs. Yeah, they, they um, block her private parts, of course. But she was only given her top. Um, it was taken to the surface by Flounder Sebastian, which we then learned that Ursula harbors a secret vendetta against King Triton because she wants to become the, the queen to rule over the sea of Atlantica. Yeah. So just to plan a an advantage for Ariel's love for Eric. So anyway, Eric had tried to find um, the girl at the beach, the one that she she saved uh, his life. I mean, suddenly Max uh, joins in, <laughs> and that's where we found Ariel. So Eric was trying to explain who the girl is and hoping that that might be her. So that's where she was trying to make contact with Eric, but. Of of course, you realize she has no voice at all. So she's trying to use all these sign language to be able to know what she was doing. So then Eric had figured it out and hoping that it really is her. But if, if that's the case, it might be someone else. So that was so she's still so he's still trying to find his way to be happy. So on her way, um, because I know Ariel was just trying her best to contact and everything. Ariel decided to take Ariel to his castle. So they take care of her. You know, she's just given a bath and give her some clothes and be able to get ready to, uh, to have some dinner. <laughs> but of course, uh, Sebastian's being chased down by Chef Louis. Um, Chef Louise. Yeah, who's a very mad chef who's attempt to cook uh, all the uh, the seafood, including uh, Sebastian. So yes, they they're going after him, and that's when you know he accidentally trashed uh, the place. He trashes the kitchen, and Colada just uh, came by to see what's going on, and <laughs> yeah. So um, all this time, you know. Eric and, and Ariel were just spending time together going to several places, you know, like going on a boat ride or exploring and, you know, just having fun until we had the song Kiss the Girl. Sebastian just uh, joins in with the rest of the ducks and other uh, creatures joining by, yeah, even birds and even <laughs> Scuttle, too. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful song, too, Kiss the Girl. So that way, um, they'll be able to help her out, and also t to have uh, Eric try to kiss uh, Ariel and actually begin to know her name, which uh, Sebastian helped them out. <laughs> but then, um, well, God knocked overboard um, by the two eels because Ursula was trying to. Her best not to let this happen. Apparently, um, just to close um, Ariel's success, she actually disguised herself as a beautiful young woman named Vanessa, and that's where she appears on shore singing with Ariel's voice as Eric recognized the song and suddenly winds up 
in in his spell directly from his eyes so that's when he became hypnotized by um, Ursula so it was like very hypnotic to just make him forget Ariel so the next day Ariel discovers that Eric is going to be married to Vanessa and that's where she got incredibly upset Scuttle discovers that Vanessa's true identity happens to be Ursula so informs Ariel who, imme who immediately pursues the wedding barge realize that it was Ursula that's tricking Eric to to marry uh, him and so that way you know he able to which they were supposed to kept promise for three days well she was going to become cream to take over so Sebastian tries to form Triton Scuttle tries to disrupt the wedding with the help of all the various sea animals around and even for the chaos that was going around the nausea shell around Ursula's neck is destroyed and that's where it restores Ariel's voice breaking the the enchantment of Ursula over Eric so now Eric had realized that Ariel is the girl with the voice that um, she actually sang to him well <laughs> she saved his life so Eric had rushes to kiss her, but then as the sunset appears, Ariel transforms back into a mermaid. And Ursula had then kidnapped her. While Triton had confront Ursula to demand Ariel's release, but the deal was inviolable because yes, she did sign the contract. And Ursula's urging often Triton to agree to take uh, Ariel's place to become queen and that's when Triton becomes uh, her prisoner giving up his Triton and all of that so he, he was transformed into a polyp you know, which had happened to all the other um, family relatives and many mer people around they all become polyp so they lose the authority over Atlantica so it was up to Ariel along with Eric to uh, to stop Ursula and, uh, and of course Eric is trying to save um, Ariel from being attacked by uh, Ursula and then finally he intervenes with the harpoon which actually caused Ursula to eventually kill the, the two eels using the trident to grow into a monstrous size yes she was becoming a giant so then Eric uh, came to the rescue to save Ariel and just stopped her by taking his ship and stabbing her completely until she's finally disappeared, gone. So now both Ariel and Eric have reunited on the surface. Trident and the other uh, polyps in Ursula's garden have revert back to their original forms. So realizing that Ariel had truly loved Eric, they finally got married. But unfortunately, she's going to be able to leave um, her family behind. But nevertheless, I mean, I mean she'll be free. I mean, she'll be able to meet them, no matter what happens. But Trident have really changed her from a mermaid to a human permanently, so that way they'll be together again for a very long time yeah. so they live happily ever after <laughs> it's a wonderful and sweet fairy tale that Disney had took the guts to put on screen and they did a great job by adapting a, a Hans Christian Andersen story I mean yeah with several changes and they wanted to make it into a feel-good film you know for kids to adults I mean this is definitely the most uh, fantasizing um, story ever made and well told and it also shows that yes Ariel can finally get a chance to become human and be able to fall in love and have the best time of her life Yeah. 
Um, some incredible voice cast that we got, like Jodie Benson doing the voice of Ariel. I mean, she was very beautiful. How she provided um, the singing voice and definitely the um, the perkish uh, exterior that she brought into the character. It just really works. You know, with Sherry Stoner um, doing all the uh, the body language and movements for these key scenes. Yeah. Um, same goes with uh, Prince Eric. I mean, with um, Josh. Uh, yeah, with Josh um, providing the key scenes of him, you know, doing all these uh, body movements. That was perfect. Um, and I definitely spot uh, some amazing, wonderful chemistry between Ariel and Eric. I mean, they really show how they shine and how charming they are, how cute and wonderful and sweet. But I guess I have to admit, though, I did sort of had a crush on Ariel. <laughs> Cause she's she's such a beautiful redhead too for a mermaid. Yeah, my brother f thinks the same way too. When when we both went to see this movie, <laughs> yeah, because of that beautiful voice of hers and how charming and, and very perky and all that, all that sweetness against her. I mean, I love her smile, her uh, body language that she had to do. You know doing exactly <laughs> what she was doing, like such as taking the fork and combing her hair or you know, humming and fantasizing, all that. And she's very hypnotic too. I mean there's no doubt about it. Yeah, I can see why everyone has a crush on her too. <laughs> and I guess she's pretty sexy too if you think about it. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying that, but you know, I know it's a children's film. But it's for families too. So, I mean, everyone should know about that. It also shows that, you know, Ariel is indeed um, a very smart, well, at times, yeah, she, she's um, very vulnerable and, you know, very uh, <laughs> curious and, you know, she's always getting into trouble no matter what happens. But deep down with it, she could be rebellious, but it, but more independently and and she just wants to to have fun becoming a human. I mean that's what she's been playing planning on for the whole time. Um but yeah Crystal Daniel Barnes did a great job of providing the voice too of Eric and hoping that he'll be able to marry Ariel. Um Pat Carroll, I mean definitely gives a, a devilishly stunning voice of, of Ursula, I mean the sea witch who who wants to become queen and and also wants to trick uh, Ariel by becoming uh, Vanessa and all that. And then you got Sebastian, uh, voiced by Samuel E. Wright, uh, given a Jamaican voice, you know, serving as the advisor and, and composer. I mean, you know, he was trying his best to watch out for Ariel and helping her out. Um, of course, uh, Flounder, voiced by Jason Moran, yeah, because he was a kid. I mean, he's he's very, you know, yes, he could be a gumpy, but nevertheless, he he was he was cool, <laughs> hilarious at times. Um, and of course, we got uh, King Triton, voiced by Kenneth Mars. Happens to be the father and the ruler of Atlantica. Tries to warn Ariel about the dangers that's happening just to protect her. I mean, overprotective, as we've seen. Uh, Scuttle is just hilarious. Yeah, voiced by Buddy Hackett. I mean, legendary comedian. Really miss him, but he basically teaches her about the human stuff, as we all know, happening. Um, then you got, of course, Edie McClure as Colada. Eric's maid, just to find out what's going on with Ben Wright as Grinsby, Eric's ballet. Um, sort of his uncle, if you think about it. And then you got um, all the sisters um, Andrena, Arista, Adela, and Alana, yeah, voiced by Kimberly Robertson. Um, 
And of course, Chef Louise, <laughs> that mad chef who just wants to go after Sebastian. Yeah, there, there's a war between them, <laughs> even at the end of the movie. I mean, there was that funny scene where Sebastian was trying to escape uh, Chef Louise uh, and tries to throw in all these tricks at him that caused him to destroy the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so there are some tender moments and then there's some uh, dramatic moments here and some wonderful and sweet moments here and there to, to explain the story. And it really shows. Uh, but of course, I, the music, all done by Alan Minkin, joined by Howard Ashman, and and surprisingly enough, they actually won the Academy Award for two songs. So, which I know they had trouble with part of your world, though. I mean, originally it was going to be cut down because the test uh, the because the test audience uh, went pretty poorly for all the kids. They were going completely nuts, so they had to fix it to make it better, and that's what they did. Kind of, kind of like what the, the Wizard of Oz had suffered with Over the Rainbow. Like they felt like it was going to be too long, so they had to fix it too. But in the end, it just worked. Um, so yeah, two songs have won the Oscar, and I'm glad it did. And I'm happy to see that many people love this film, and I'm glad how popular it was. I mean, yes, people couldn't stop talking about. The Little Mermaid uh, back in 89 and 1990, all the way through until Beauty and the Beast came along and people couldn't stop talking about that either. Uh, Aladdin, well, that's another story too. So it's almost like, you know, the way Frozen was becoming too with their success. I mean, but hey, um, that's why we love it so much. I mean, it's, it's incredibly uh, jolly and creative, fun, um, sweet, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, roughly this movie was coming out at the same time as a Don Bluth film called All Dogs Go to Heaven, and so they're almost going for the competition during the Thanksgiving weekend. So that was kind of tough, but in the end, they, they both did very well. I mean, particularly Little Mermaid was indeed a hit. But I... I Definitely love the songs, you know, of course, Under the Sea, awesome song, with Sebastian singing by uh, Samuel E. Wright, and Love, Part of Your World, you know, with Jody Benson singing, and of course, um, Kiss the Girl, Sebastian, and yes, Poor Unfortunate Souls, with Pat Carroll singing. So actually had uh, all these... Uh, Little Mermaid live uh, performances that we were getting. Uh, they played them at um, the Hollywood Bowl in Hollywood. They did it twice. And we also recently had um, the Little Mermaid live on ABC that aired uh, recently. I haven't watched it though, sadly, because I was so busy with other fans. I was doing some more movie reviews of the Terminator films. So that's why. Um, I'll probably check it out later. Maybe it might be available on on ABC app. Because um, I know they're also promoting the Disney Plus streaming service, which will include the movie, along with all the other Disney films out there, which has already been launched recently. Uh, they also had a ride for, and even all the other events uh, for the movie at Disney parks, you know, like Disneyland and Walt Disney World. In fact, uh, the Blu-ray even contains uh, a virtual uh, 3D uh, ride that you get to experience about what was it like if you're actually in there. We actually ride on the she cell and you explore what the story relies on. I mean, wow. That would have been awesome. The Little Mermaid, um, a wonderful fantasy that you'll never forget. I mean, I loved this movie ever since I was a kid. Again, and you know, having to see it three times in theaters with my family, and having to own the the DVD and Blu-ray, I'm kind of curious with the 4K remaster because that would be really nice to check it out. But yep, 
That's why it's considered to be the best animated feature Disney had to offer after such a hard work that they had to deal with back in the 80s and joining by with the 90s and, and so on. So, it would always be remembered even after 30 years. So, Anyway, that's The Little Mermaid and I give the film 5 stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora and I'll see you later. Bye.